This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Mapper Forward's first on-demand workshop, How to Become a Coffee Consultant, available now online for you to learn at your own pace with a certificate available upon completion. Click the link in the show notes to access today for just 50 euros. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Ford Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is the first in a five-part series with David Paparelli from M. From M. Cultivo. <laughs> David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Lee. Excited to be here. <laughs> you are required to say all the names from now on <laughs> on this series. <laughs> yeah, no, the Paparelli and M. Cultivo is always a challenge. I shouldn't put those two in the same sentence for sure. Um, we are going to have a really, really interesting conversation. I, I get really, really excited about series like this um, because these none of the, the subjects that we're going to talk about have easy answers. So our series is about the changing dynamics in the coffee value chain um, and, well, specifically the coffee supply chain. So in this series, we're going to be talking about supply chain instability, um, m- migration and labour Uh, shortages and challenges, the price of coffee, what's going on with the EU and their new regulations, and we're going to talk about technology. Yikes. It's a lot to cover. (laughs) It is a lot to cover. And I have to say, (laughs) this delightfully broke my brain while I was getting ready for this series. So hat off to you, sir, for for achieving uh, that status that really, uh, I, I really get to the point where I'm like, I can't find any information on most of these subjects and, <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, there are a lot of things here that it's really challenging to get the kind of information that we wanted to be able to dissect it for everybody in the audience. So we're going to do that. But before we get started, tell everyone what M Cultivo is. <laughs> I did it. Sure. Yes. <laughs> you did it. Yeah. So uh, M Cultivo has uh, been around for about three years now and um our model has evolved over that time, but we've really settled in this unique space where we deploy technology and capital and provide market access to uh, small to medium sized coffee producers, specifically in the specialty coffee market all over mm-hmm. the world. Why did it start to exist? How did, like, where did it come from? Yeah, it started out with this really kind of basic idea. Um, had an opportunity to... Um, go get a master's at LSE and take a step back from the coffee industry that I've been in for a long time and uh, take a look at some more of these fundamental challenges in coffee. And one that kept coming up was this idea of information asymmetry or information imbalance in the coffee Mm -hmm. supply chain. So basic at a very basic level, that means that buyers have a lot of information and suppliers or producers, they don't have a lot of information that creates this negotiation imbalance. And so we sought to um, correct that imbalance a little bit. Uh, one way to do that was te- with technology. So we started off with this really kind of simple product, which was we have all this access to pricing information just from being mm-hmm. on the buying side of the coffee industry. Let's start sending kind of SMS text messages out to coffee producers all over the world with that pricing information. So they can start having a little bit more uh, wow. clout in their negotiations. And so it started there and then it kind of expanded into Uh, supply chain traceability and information on yield rates and currency exchange rates and all these other things. Um, And then we realized that um, if we're tracking all these assets in coffee all over the world, we should consider that almost like in its own asset class and we can invest in those. So we can provide financing against those assets on our system. So we started doing that for coffee producers. And then kind of the last leg of that is coffee producers were always interested in market access through us. And so we started out with an auction platform in partnership with Cup of Excellence and Alliance for Coffee Excellence. And uh, we provided that uh, and we've expanded since then to more marketplace concepts and offer sheets. And so we're trying to just kind of connect the entire thing. But the the core fundamental uh, mission of the company was to correct that information balance to start with. And it's just flourished into all these other services and products. And it's very exciting to watch. We have to shout out Diego Barayona because uh, he is how I found out about you and they have their auction coming up, folks, very soon. So make sure that you check out their Instagram, uh, Los Perineos. Uh, Check out the Instagram sample boxes are going out for that auction currently. But um, it's really exciting what you guys are doing. And for me, it's the reason I'm so excited about it is because you're not just talking about it, you're actually doing it, which is 
wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. It's good to have a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect after this, you're going to have quite a few more, I hope. Um, so today we're in our first kind of exploration in the, uh, the changing dynamics of the coffee supply chain. We're going to be talking about supply chain instability. So where in, from your vantage point, are you seeing most of the, the instability in the, the coffee supply chain? Yes, well, Lee, you listed a few of the topics right out of the gate, right? Mm -hmm. and we'll cover a few of them today, but um, uh, kind of especially over the last three to four years, it seems like chaos is a little is accelerating, right? right. Um, so instability is more and more. So you have things like rising cost of production. We talked about lack of labor and migration. We can throw climate change into the fold. Um, there's political instability on an international level and on a kind of a national local level for coffee producers. And then to kind of compound all that, lack of access to finance and access to markets and new customers. Mm -hmm. And so all of that's creating this very in stable dynamic supply chain. And I think the worst part about this is coffee as an agricultural product is sort of inherently slowly evolving and adapting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's just guardrails to growing coffee. It takes three years, three to four years to, to take, a, take a tree from a seed to a fully producing coffee tree. So mm -hmm. if you plant the wrong varietal or you plant too much or you plant too little, you have a three to four year cycle to, to adapt. Whereas it seems like our world is changing by the minute, right? So how do you, how do you change that? So it's not the most progressive field by its nature. Um, and yet it sort of needs to be and requires massive investment in order to adapt to what's going on in the supply chain now. We're going to explore through this series uh, a lot of the, the downward forces that are being placed on a lot of these things, you know, things like the migra migration of workforce and, and, and regulation that's being placed on these things. How, who's being the hurt the most from all of this? Do you think it's the producing end, the consuming end, the middle of it? Who's being hurt the most? Yeah, I, it's a great question, um, and this is probably going to sound cliche, but needs to be repeated over and over again, right? I mean, coffee producers, small to medium-sized coffee producers and farmers that surround their operations, right? Mm -hmm. um, so people that are actually processing, exporting coffee and growing coffee, mm -hmm. um, they are the least diversified in the supply chain, generally speaking, right? And yeah. so... When you look at a supply chain instability, you're generally just you're you're more getting into this theme of distribution of risk throughout the supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, and if you take on too much risk, it's it, it becomes problematic um, mm -hmm. because things do happen, um, and that's how businesses fail. Um, so they're not assessing risk appropriately, or they're taking on too much risk, and and they can't manage that risk. And so with a coffee producer, they are in a specific geographic location in one country in one coffee growing region, in one part of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult and requires massive investment to move that operation to a whole nother part of the world, right? It's, it's, it'd be near impossible, right? If I'm a Guatemalan coffee farmer, I'm probably going to stay farming in Guatemala. Um, so if there's any local political issues or international political issues or instability there, that becomes a huge problem for me. If, um, if there's any climate or weather issues, flooding, drought, um, over, overheat mm -hmm. or, or cold, you know, they had hail in Guatemala, um, I think last week, which is unheard of. Um, that becomes a giant problem. Um, if there's any disease that's spread in that area for the coffee plants, that's a huge issue. Whereas from the buying end, if I'm an importer or a roaster, um, if there's a problem in Guatemala, well, I can go buy coffee from... Panama, or if there's a problem in Central America, I can go buy coffee from Colombia, or if there's a problem in Latin America, I go buy, go buy coffee from Indonesia. So I can kind of, you know, spread that risk out by building my supply chain appropriately. Whereas, you know, farmers in 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 these specific locales, they sort of they take an enormous amount of risk on, and um, and it's really hard for them to recover when things happen, right? Um, mm. As we talked about before, it's three four year growth cycle. Um, so if something really catastrophic happens, it takes you three to four years, five, five years maybe to get even back in the game um, if you want to get back in the game or can. So 
I think that's who's taken on the most burden in this uh, supply chain instability. The cost of living crisis is a whole other side of all of this, but it seems to be impacting um, everybody across the supply chain. Um, What role do you think that's putting on the instability of the supply chain? (laughs) Your face is saying, where do we start with this? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, so there's a couple, there's definitely a few things going on here, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe I'll bring up an anecdote. And I don't know if this will be helpful, but I was talking to a coffee producer in Burundi um, and they, they, they spoke about this specifically. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And the issue for them uh, is is twofold. The government sets the cherry price. Right. Uh, for that. They pay for coffee farmers. So we like to think that uh, cherry price is going to keep going. We should just pay coffee farmers more. That's OK. Well, governments are, are providing a ceiling on that. So they have two things happening. They have a cost of living crisis. So they're they're increasing their employee salaries by 20%. So that increases wow. their cost of production um, just to keep up with the cost of living uh, in, in Burundi. So that's massive. Wow. The other thing that's happening, government sets the cherry price and they take all the dollars and then they convert those dollars to Burundi francs on behalf of this coffee producing organization, mm-hmm. right? Well, the, the conversion rate they're using in the currency is half of what the international market will take. And so not only do they have the cost of living crisis where they're increasing salaries by 20%, um, cherry prices have now effectively doubled in some way because the currency exchange from dollars to Burundi francs. And so I guess my point on the cost of living crisis in the developing world or these emerging markets is it gets, it gets, it becomes an exponential problem because you have a con- a currency conversion and, and volatility problem mm. to the value of that local currency and the cost of living crisis on top of that. And so to keep up, you might have to increase your wages by 20%. Your labor is going to be 70, 80% of the cost of your operation on an annual basis. And so lots of um, a, a crisis that we all know very well in a place like Australia, where you sit in a place like the UK, where, where I sit, but uh, it is it is exponentially worse in the areas that coffee mm. is produced. Yeah, I mean, everyone's feeling it, but people are feeling it more than others. And dare I say, I don't know that we've even started to get to the worst of it. Yeah, I don't I don't think so. No, it's going to be interesting moving ahead. And, and this leads us perfectly to the, the next episode where we're going to talk about migration and, and labor challenges because... Those labor and migration challenges are, uh, they're not only challenging for the employees, but the employer now has to figure out new problems that they have to solve um, as this becomes an escalating issue. So join us for the next episode, folks, where we talk about this. This is something that I feel that uh, we, we're we going to see the flow on effects of these challenges ripple over the next couple of years. Um, and and have effects both in supply of coffee and the pricing of coffee uh, and the availability in general. But so join us for the next episode, folks. Thanks, David. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in, friends. There are two ways you can support this podcast. Firstly, become a paid member of our YouTube channel. Secondly, you can join our Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video before you leave and check the show notes for more information. Now, this is what you should check out next.